Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm, I hope you're having a happy new year thus far. I'm Ben Rue, Program Manager here at the Forum on Workplace Inclusion. I'm pleased to have you here today for DEI and Decision Making, the, the Undeniable and Unbreakable Connection <clears throat> with Nigel Vander, Vander Linden and Dave DeBacker of Power and Noodle. This is the first webinar of our 2022 Forum on Workplace Inclusion podcast webinar series. We hope you enjoy the, this experience and this find this information is helpful in your work and join us for future webinars. <clears throat> Today, Nigel and, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Today, Nigel and Dave will be presenting for 45 minutes with questions throughout with 15 minutes of Q&A at the end. The chat will be closed, so please use the Q&A for questions and comments. Closed captioning is available. Just select live transcript up the live chat transcript option on your screen. There's also a link to the slides in the chat. At the end of this webinar, you'll be asked to fill out a brief survey on your experience. Please take a moment to fill out this survey as your feedback helps us shape future webinars. We truly appreciate your open and honest feedback. Today's webinar is SHRM and HRCI eligible. The activity IDs will be provided at the end of the webinar. It is also being recorded and being broadcast live on Facebook. The recording will be available, will be posted onto our website within the next week. Visit our website for workplaceinclusion.org or on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn for more information. The forum is dedicated to providing the very best learning and development programming for diversity, equity, and inclusion education. We provide webinars and podcasts on a variety of topics on a monthly basis throughout the, throughout the year, as well as our flagship conference in the spring. We provide most of our resources like this webinar and our podcast for free. We're able to do this because of generous support from, of our community. We know these resources have great value to you as so many of you regularly participate. In order to sustain our work, we have added a donation button to our website to, and to each webinar and podcast page. There's a suggested donation for each program. We ask that you donate what you feel is the value of the service to help us continue to bring the very best DEI learning and development to you and to help us fulfill our mission of engaging people, advancing ideas, and igniting change. Every donation is fully tax deductible and greatly appreciated. Without further ado, I would like to go ahead and hand things over to Nigel and Dave. Great. Let me share my screen. Thank you, Ben. And hopefully everybody can see my screen now. So thanks everyone and, and welcome to the webinar. My name is Dave and, and I work alongside Nigel at Power Noodle. And, and really depending on who you ask, I, I have some particular interest and expertise in decision-making, specifically in fostering what we call quality decisions or quality decision-making. And as such, I'm, I'm Power Noodle's resident decision geek which is a term I'm fine with, although I, I prefer the term enthusiast, but maybe a bit. And inclusion is something that's really very near and dear to my heart. So I'm, I'm really happy to have this opportunity to be with everybody here for the next hour. So with that, I'm gonna let it, Nigel introduce himself and just tell you just a little bit about Power Noodle in the process. Hi everyone, and thanks uh, both Ben and, and Dave for that brief intro. My name is Nigel Vanderlinden, I'm CEO of Power Noodle. Um, for context, uh, Dave and I, or rather our organization, provide both decision facilitation software and expertise that leverages something that we call collaboration equity to help you and your teams make better decisions. So in one place, uh, you can solicit information from your teams, discuss and debate and vote on solutions, make a decision, turn it into an action plan, and in fact, communicate that out to your team and stakeholders and how and why that decision was made. We're thrilled to be or to have the opportunity to uh, discuss this topic of, a uh, very important topic of DE&I and, and decision-making with you. And um, we uh, uh, welcome your, your questions throughout. So as Ben highlighted, please feel free to add Q, your questions to the Q&A as we walk through our material. We do have our colleague, Susanna, that uh, is monitoring the chat, and Dave and I will stop intermittently to uh, surface questions um, throughout the presentation and then revisit those at the end as well. Over to you, Dave. 
All right. Thanks, Nigel. Um, so I'm gonna get my, my clicker to work here. Maybe my clicker's not working. I'll have to go old school. Just a second while I get it to advance my slide for me. There we go. I guess that's the one I should have had up before <laughs> in case you wanted to see our pictures. So um, really quickly, the, the agenda you see here on the screen outlines how we're gonna cover our time today. So we're gonna start by touching base on this connection, um, some points of similarity. We'll talk about recent shifts and impacts that affect both of our worlds. And what I mean is D&I and decision-making worlds. And then we'll kind of forecast a little bit ahead in terms of where we see things going. And then we'll touch on how to adapt and succeed in kind of that new normal. And as Nigel said, in addition to some questions throughout, we'll, have, we'll save some time for questions at the end. All right. Um, so in the synopsis of this webinar, it was really noted that the realms of DNI and decision making were, were closely, if not inextricably connected. So I just wanted to start off by delving into that a little bit. And of course, how we how well we interact with each other is a fundamental element of both. So, so collaboration is going to come up a lot as well. So diversity, equity, inclusion, and quality decision making are really somewhat two sides of the same coin. And I say that because it's really almost inconceivable to be able to make a quality decision without the effective input and collaboration of multiple people who are inherently diverse, diverse in how they work, how they think, their lived experiences and the like. And really the more diverse and inclusive we are, the more innovative we are. And that increased innovation is vital for organizations as they make decisions about their future. And that's really because of the simple fact that without such differences, the best ideas often never get surfaced in the first place, or they don't get selected when they do get surfaced. So the principles and tenets between our two areas are also aligned. You know, we, we both want to ensure that not only do we have a diverse group of thoughts and opinions represented, but also that we've created those conditions for that diverse group to be included and for everyone's input to be duly and equally considered without bias. So we both need to remove those barriers, provide for psychological safety, and effectively communicate with everybody. And this involves shared concepts like information equity and collaboration equity, which affects both DNI and decision making. So, so one quick example, I just wanted a practical example I wanted to share to highlight the overlap between the fields is that, you know, one of the top five biases affect impacting our decisions making is something called the similarity bias. And many of you have heard about this, and it's the, it's our innate tendency to prefer what is like us more than what is different. So while this shouldn't be an issue, it is. And it's the classic in-group versus out-group phenomenon, and it continues to plague not just our school grounds and social media channels, but also our adult professional corporate lives. And if we can mitigate biases like this one, we not only solve a barrier to D&I, but we also solve a big one in the decision-making realm. So another element that these two have in common, and, and perhaps not surprisingly, given how tightly coupled they are, is that they're both really struggling to move the needle. And I have a couple to highlight this. I included just a few third-party perspective bits here. And that 75% stat on the left is a, is a real reminder of how much work remains on the D and I side. And the one on the right, um, well, that one, that one's from the world of decision making, and it's just plain deflating, especially since things have gotten worse since the research behind that stat was done. And across the bottom is a quote that highlights the, how the inclusion, inclusion of diverse perspectives directly correlates with better decisions. So there's lots of other overlap, and I could spend this whole hour sharing stats and quotes like the ones here, but I suspect you all get the point. In fact, many of you probably already believed in this connection. Um, before this webinar, which is why you signed up for it in the first place. So, so let's move on and talk about, you know, what's transpired and what continues to transpire that results in our current kind of less than ideal states. Well, cutting to the chase, our world, our working environment is faster and more complex or uncertain than ever. So when we think about pace or speed, most of us feel this rather, rather intuitively. But beyond that anecdotal and qualitative side of things, there's findings such as the one here from McKinsey. 
and, it, and it's quite honestly mind-boggling to think that 375 of those companies are, are going to be disappearing soon. And to add to that, in, you know, in 1958, the average lifespan of companies on the S&P 500 was 61 years. And in 2017, it was 18 years. So basically companies that used to exit in their 60s are now exiting as teenagers. So directly related and certainly contributing to those stats is the exponential increase in complexity and uncertainty in that we all work in now. And certainly the pandemic has magnified things, but even before that, we were in that same kind of similar boat where it was difficult to make sense of where we're at or predict where we're going. And I, there's this one book I remember reading called Immunity to Change, and the author summed it up so well by saying, um, the complexity of our world has surpassed the complexity of our mind. And, and you know, of course, in and all this complexity stuff comes the disruptive technology and other forms of change and transformation. The quintessential Netflix, Uber, Airbnb people of disruptors and, and the like. And, and two other quick, really topical examples I wanted to cover here was, you know, first, there's never been a trillion dollar company his, in history until just a really a few years ago. And as, as we sit here today, we actually have five of them now. And one of them earlier this month hit $3 trillion, which is something we just couldn't fathom years ago. And, you know, exactly one week ago today, last Thursday, Ford, who's been around since 1903, hit an all-time market cap record, $100 billion. And that sounds great, you know, until you consider that, that milestone is a mere 10% of where Tesla is at, despite Tesla coming along literally 100 years later in 2003. So the faster, the more complex, uncertain, and volatile we get, the more contrast like this one become the norm. And, and again, there's lots of other examples. The point is that each of these highlight the speed and complexity, uncertainty, disruption, change, et cetera, at play. And the real point, you know, of calling this out, oops, sorry, and, and thanks for sticking with me on this. The real point of calling this out relates to my previous comment about DNI and decision-making being so closely related. And that is, the faster and more complex our worlds get, the more no single individual, and rarely even any individual team or silo, has all the ideas and information needed to make a quality decision. So the need for DEI is undeniably increasing under these conditions. All right, uh, I wanted to illustrate this trend, this shift a little more visually. So you can see how the speed and complexity might be represented on a simple graph like the one shown here. And, and as you can see, both of these, you know, speed and complexity have been on a slight, somewhat exponential growth curve for a number of years now, largely due to a lot of advances in technology. And, you know, sp speed's increasing and it'll continue on that current trajectory, thanks to things like Moore's Law and, and the like. And complexity has a similar trajectory but perhaps it's even more pronounced for those reasons we just discussed earlier. And, you know, we're in a weird pandemic period now. We're going to come out of that into some post-pandemic era, era, hopefully soon. But nobody knows what that looks like. So that complexity could be even higher and uncertainty in the future could be much higher. And along those two lines, I really want to add in an additional one here. And I'm going to call that workscape. And that this term is being used after consulting with a DEI expert. And what it relates to is not only our workspaces and our workplaces, but also the general landscape of our working environment, hence the term workscape. So let me add that line in and I'm gonna to speak to it. So compared to where we are today, many workspaces used to be relatively homogeneous, homogeneous, sorry. <laughs> many people live near each other um, as we all had to be kind of within commuting distance to the office, we worked in shared offices, we dressed kind of similarly, sat in the same meeting rooms and lunch rooms, etc. Basically, not too many degrees of separation between most. So the workspace, you know, subsequently began to evolve or at least change. And, and many of you will recall that it wasn't long ago that there's a lot of publications and a lot of talk about, you know, having four or five distinct generations in the workforce and the challenges that would come with that, with having such age differences and mindsets of these people working shoulder to shoulder. And we heard about boomer millennial conflicts, people love to bash Gen X, Z, Z worth the ethics and the likes. 
So what happened was po basic population demographics contributed to an organic increase into the levels of differences in the workscape. So, you know, in addition and more recently as a result of widespread social justice movements, additional workspace differences have come about as organizations have put more of a renewed focus on ensuring they have better representation as it relates to, to gender, race, religion, and the like. And these efforts have further contributed to increased in workscape differences. And the workscape probably changed much more notably and much more rapidly two years ago when we were all blindsided by COVID. So, you know, work from home, remote, hybrid, virtual work became almost the instantaneous new normal. And with geography no longer being a constraint, global hiring, global hiring reached an all time high. So now we have a lot more variability in terms of who our coworkers, bosses, subordinates, partners, et cetera, are, where they're located, what time zone, their first language, et cetera. And hand in hand with that new work, new kind of era and mode, the rapport between workers has become vastly more transactional as opposed to relational. And while there might be some positive upsides to that, one of the big downsides is that we have a diminished opportunity and ability to really get to know someone, to understand and appreciate their unique circumstances and differences. So as we move faster and have less opportunity or time to foster relationships, we have less capacity for recognizing those differences, being tolerant and being inclusive. Many of us are now just many, one of many faces in a Zoom thumbnail and sometimes just a name. Now I say that, but one perhaps less obvious aspect of this remote work shift was actually pointed out to me as I prepared for this session, and, and that's in this new workscape, many people are now much more inclined to be their authentic selves. And, and by example, an introverted person doesn't have to necessarily spend their nine to five trying to come across as extroverted in the office. And while that newfound freedom is an upside, um, it also contributes to increasing levels of variance in the, works, in the workscape. So distilling all this down, our workscapes really have changed in terms of who we're working with, um, there's increased differences in terms of where we're working and where our colleagues are working. And, and also when and how we're all working varies widely. We're working virtually in Teams and Zoom rather than physical rooms. We're working synchronously or asynchronously to accommodate different geographies and time zones. And these types of factors alongside others all impact the workscape. And the net result is that the level or degree of workscape differences has continued to trend higher, as you can see by that gray line on the graph. Uh, now, before I move on, um, because I've talked a lot, I want to check in with Susanna to see if there's any questions about what I've covered so far. Susanna? Yeah, so we have a we have a couple of questions here. Um, so just pertaining to the graph that you're showing here, uh, somebody had written in speed of what, what is measured and how, and I believe that you kind of expanded on that, but if you can just go into a little bit more detail. Yeah, so the speed basically of, of business and work, um, where we might have had time to craft and execute strategy over many, you know, let's say months and years, that has been compressed now and you have to do those things in hours and days, like maybe weeks. So everything we need to do, everything we need to get done has to be done a lot quicker. So that was what we meant by speed. And organizations are either going to succeed or fail much quicker than they used to. And that goes to the comment about the S&P life, lifespan is mm -hmm. you're either gonna get in and make a go of it and be competitive and succeed or at least stay viable, or you're gonna exit pretty darn quick. We're not going to have a lot of people that hang in there and kind of muddle around. And, and that's what most of the stats are talking about from a speed perspective. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, I, I believe so. Perfect. Okay. Any others or should we get back to the presentation? Uh, we do have one more um, uh, regarding the workscape differences um, that you've outlined. Does that include diversity or is diversity a separate element to this? It's uh, a good question. Um, so if I'm understanding the question right, the short answer would be yes. Um, diverse, diversity could be, and at least, partially, at least partially is included as one of the workscape differences. And we decided to focus on workscape differences today because diversity, the special word, the reserve word diversity can be a very loaded word. And depending on your perspective and what industry reports you read, 
diversity might be increasing, staying flat, or decreasing in recent years. Mm -hmm. And while I considered putting a diversity line on the graph, as well as one for inclusion, I, I simply don't have the expertise to do that, especially not within this in, in this crowd of experts on those topics. Mm -hmm. So Thanks. workscape differences can include elements of diversity, like the age one I, really, mm -hmm. I um, mentioned. Perfect. All right. Okay. Um, so where does that leave us? So we've got these three trend lines here, each note with notably upward trends as of late. And where the challenge and the opportunity comes in is if and how we adapt to these realities. If we can recognize and leverage these trends, we should be able to improve our collaboration and by extension, the quality of our decisions. And I think this is where things have fallen down for a great many individuals and a great many companies. So speaking of the collaboration and decision-making elements, let's add those lines to complete the graph here. There we go. So as you can see from the graph, there really hasn't been much change in collaboration, uh, the efficacy of our collaboration or the quality of our decisions leading up to 2020. And that's because traditional approaches and methods, such as meetings, whiteboards, sticky note workshops, thought democracy voting, and other in-person synchronous methods didn't really evolve much. So the line shown in amber represents our collaboration efficacy. Basically how efficient, effective, inclusive, and equitable our collaboration is and how well it fits into our current environment. So as I mentioned, if we continue to use these traditional outdated paradigms and tools that don't really fit in with this new faster, complex, and highly differentiated workscape, starting in 2020, you start to see this line trending in the wrong direction. And with collaboration efficacy being somewhat of a proxy for the quality of the decisions, we naturally extend or extrapolate that impact on that lighter blue decision quality line. And it actually takes a slightly bigger hit because there's more than just collaboration um, elements that go into that. So, you know, the realm of decisions and the world of decision making can be, um, is where power noodles existed for many years. And so this, this lighter, the story this lighter blue line tells is no surprise to us, but it can be a little revealing and shocking to others. And taken all together, you have somewhat of a perfect storm in that in order to survive and thrive, we need to make increasingly better decisions faster than ever at a time when we're slow and struggling to adapt to increasing levels of differences in the workscape and struggling to find effective ways to collaborate with others under this new normal. And the net effect is the gap area donated by, or denoted by the double-headed blue arrow here. As three, trend line, as three of the lines trends up and two trend down, kind of creating the gap shown here, this has a number of impacts on each of us literally on a daily basis. And what are those impacts? What do those trends mean for all of us? Well, continuing to use those outdated approaches to collaboration prevents psychological safety, which is a key element of getting different types of people to work together, whether they're making decisions or otherwise. And where diverse perspectives are not heard or included equitably, vital information remains hidden. When people remain effectively excluded, collaboration is done poorly, information is hidden, and, and low quality decisions are made, getting people on the same page and supporting those decisions becoming becomes incredibly challenging. You, you simply don't get the alignment and buy-in you need. So even if we got lucky and we made a good decision despite ourselves, we fall down where the rubber meets the road in the execution or implementation phase, which often manifests itself as delayed, uh, unnecessary, difficult, or outright failed projects. So as a result of all the items you know, mentioned here, confidence in the leaders and confidence in the organization itself wanes. And other negative impacts like reduced um, employee satisfaction engagement scores and elevated levels of churn. And we see that manifested in what's being referred to as the great resignation right now. So as glum a picture as this all paints, it's actually just a little bit worse than that. And you know, left unchecked and based where are we are today, things are going to go from bad to worse. And so in this graph, we've actually extrapolated out five years and as you can see, the same 2022 gap exists, but it somewhat pales in comparison to the gap that we see ahead of us. So if we weren't there already, I feel kind of confident in saying that we're now at an inflection point. 
those top three lines, the speed, complexity, and work, workscape differences, they're not suddenly going to go in the opposite direction or even level off, and, and perhaps naturally and rightly so. In contrast, what is in our control is whether we leverage those increases in our workscape differences to be smarter and more innovative about inclusion and equity. In doing so, we we'll increase the effectiveness of our collaboration and increase the quality of our decisions. So again, I threw a whole bunch of stuff at people there. So um, I've only got two more slides to cover, but I will pause and just check in with Susanna once more because I see lights hitting the question and answer area. So I suspect new things have shown up in there. Yes, we've got lots of great questions uh, and we'll we'll pick up a, a few of them here and I'll save a couple for the Q&A at the end. Um, okay. But relevant to what you're currently speaking on, we had a great question. Uh, what criteria are used to measure decision quality? Oh, that, that's a great one. And, I, and Nigel will laugh because he'll say, don't ask Dave that question because he will talk for two days. <laughs> um, I, so I'll, the very quick version is, there's actually a book called Decision Quality. There's a whole science to it. It goes back 50 or 60 years. But what we're talking about today is the most in the most simplistic terms, there are six elements to achieve a quality decision. And what we're looking for is you can you know, hit a checkbox or 100% value on each of those six elements. Um, there's a mention of that coming later. And I think actually maybe even a picture of the book type thing. Mm -hmm. It's not our book, by the way. We're not endorsing it. But, but but it, it, it answers that specific question. So if you just Google six elements of decision quality, you can see them right there. Perfect. Um, any others, Susanna? Uh, yeah, well, one more. Um, somebody was interested to know more about the data uh, that's collected to measure decision quality and collaboration efficacy, um, if that isn't covered in the book that, that you just referenced. <laughs> the, the data. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's lots of stats on the kind of efficacy of it. I say lots. There's lots for the people who are in there. And mm -hmm. basically, the rest of the world doesn't know anything about it. Yeah. So how, how, do I, how do I do this? Unless you're subscribing to a framework where you measure decision quality, you don't have the stats. So in cases where we measure it, we know the stats are pretty abysmal. Um, and, there's, and we know the reasons why for, most, for the most part. It's the fixing it. Um, changing the paradigms. That's the big barrier. So I can't really get into the detailed stats right now because mm -hmm. they're kind of all over the place. <laughs> That's great. Okay. Um, so we'll circle back to some of these questions later. Sorry. Click the wrong button there. Okay. So I'm just going to quickly move on here. Uh, like I said, I have two slides. So so as this divergence gets more and more pronounced, as that gap widens that we see there, we're gonna to continue to feel those negative impacts that we touched on a couple of slides ago. They'll just get more severe. And you know, I ran this graph by a colleague a few days ago, and he said, you know, it reminded him of the massive and growing income gap between the haves and the have-nots. And just as that income gap is effectively making society poorer as a result of its continued growth, so does this one. The bigger this gap here is on our screen, the more we suffer the effects. So I, I don't know if that analogy works for others, but I thought I'd share it just in case it does because it worked for him. So analogies notwithstanding, you know, as a result of that, the combination of these trends shown here, I, I would say there's an emergent and an urgent need for a shift in people, process, technology to change that tra trajectory. And of course, as is the case with changing landscapes, there's going to be winners and losers as we, as we progress through this, this year and the next. And, you know, the, the losers, if you will, they'll just ignore and deny and delay changing their paradigms and ways of working together. And they'll downplay the role of D&I and collaboration, and they'll continue to make progressively lower decisions. And eventually they'll become a part of that statistic we talked about in terms of organizational life expectancy. But the winners, the winners are going to be the ones who recognize what's going on and adapt both timely and effectively. The leaders will adapt and grow and bring new ways of working to the organizations. Organize, um, employees in those organizations will be more engaged and loyal and productive. And when employees see that their voice is heard and reflected in the decision-making process, they'll feel valued and respected, creating a sense of belonging. 
and Nigel's going to be touching on some of these issues shortly. So, and finally, um, I wanted to touch briefly on why we feel that this audience in particular is well suited to improve things on both the DEI and decision making fronts simultaneously, kind of killing two birds with one stone, as the adage goes. So first off, it's obvious that many leaders and organizations need help. Um, you know, the efforts to be genuinely more diverse, inclusive, and equitable in, in how we collaborate have been slow and in some cases relatively superficial. There's been al already broken approaches to collaboration have been extended and often amplified as a result of shifting to online, virtual, or remote. And many of these people hear about the poor stats and, and they realize there's a need and opportunity to improve their DEI posture, but at the same time don't have a good grasp on what to change, how to change, or where even to begin. So fortunately them, for them, each of you as DEI professionals, and whether that's as an executive, a leader, a practitioner, a consultant, or whatever, you're the ones that they're going to be looking forward to help. Um, you're the skilled and trusted guides along you know what's going to be very new and unfamiliar ground to many people and just really one quick tangent comment here is that i've talked about a lot about how our two realms are so similar but one potentially large advantage d and i has over decision making came about last may when the iso unveiled the 4315 standard on diversity and diversity and inclusion and personally, I'm extremely envious as I can only dream of there being a standard related to quality decision making. But I mention this as an example of one recent event that serves as both a high profile reminder of the importance of DNI, but also as a trigger for organizations to be, take more immediate and concrete steps in moving that needle forward in this regard. You know, companies recognize the positive impacts associated with achieving certifications to standard, to ISO standards like that. You know, both for, for bottom line performance, but also for external optics. And whatever their motivator, um, as a result of that creation of that new standard last year, companies are going to be looking for expertise and support in this regard in the coming months and years. So uh, back to my symbiotic comment from kind of the beginning. As each of you help organizations improve on the DNI front, you're also helping those same organizations improve their decision making. And as people like Nigel and I get organizational leaders to improve their decision making, you're going to see improvements in the DEI area as well. By, by improving and fostering one, you necessarily do the same for the other. It's, it's like an infinite interconnected loop. And that was my weak attempt, by the way, at that imagery that you see there. That's not my forte. Um, so finally, you know, the gap that we talked about here exists because our environment is fundamentally and quickly changed but we haven't adapted our paradigms and processes in lockstep with that. So through your efforts, you can alter that trajectory so that there's more of a positive correlation between that, those increased workspace dif workscape differences and both the efficacy of our collaboration and the quality of our decisions. And as idealistic and naive as that sounds, that's also you know, the simple reality of what should be happening. Each of us is different in one or more ways and what makes us different or unique should not result in us being excluded in any way for any reason. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and pass the baton to Nigel to walk us through the next section. Thanks so much, Dave. I'll just do a quick technical check. Can everyone see my screen in full presentation mode? Dave, can you comment? Yep. Thumbs up. Excellent, thank you. So as Dave has outlined, there is very much a symbiotic relationship between quality decisions or decision making and the E and I. And um, I very much welcome the challenge that he's uh, outlined to all of you that you have a significant role to play in not only advancing the E and I in your organizations, but at that same time also advancing um, the speed and quality at which an organization can make decisions. And the starting point is something that we call collaboration equity. It's really the path, or what I like to describe as the path to quality decision making. And I think as we go through this, it will further emphasize how decision making and DEI are, as Dave puts it, 
two sides of the same coin. Just to um, establish a, a definition, collaboration equity enables your team to contribute inclusive of what makes them different. And that can be their location, time zone, role, technical proficiency, gender, race, ethnicity, age, physical abilities. Again, creating the conditions for your organization to collaborate and make decisions inclusive of those circumstances. How do we create uh, collaboration equity in your decision-making process? So we outline the six steps or, excuse me, five steps or, or categories in this process. And it begins with a purpose. And in particular, declaring that you are entering into a decision-making process or to say another way that a decision must be made or is about to be made. It also includes engaging diverse perspectives that they've highlighted. Engaging diverse perspectives is positively correlated to um, decision outcomes. You must design that decision-making process for inclusion, meaning creating the ideal conditions for participants to contribute to your decision-making process. Um, we might also say that this is about removing obstacles to authentic participation. Mitigating bias and group dysfunction, which can very much impact the quality of our decision outcomes. And then creating information equity, which we mean ensuring that participants and stakeholders have the information that they require to effectively contribute to the decision-making process, disseminate and action the outcomes. Let's start with that first step, setting the purpose. So decisions are sometimes known by another name. That could be brainstorming, collaboration, problem solving, teamwork. However, when we consider the purpose of these activities, it's often a decision. It's not brainstorming for brainstorming sake, but rather brainstorming for the sake of making the decision. So by declaring the need for a decision, you're directing attention to a situation where a deliberate choice must be made and, and triggering an intentional decision-making process which includes who should be involved, how we design that process in particular for inclusion, how we mitigate bias and group dysfunction throughout that process, and then finally, how we create information equity. So I'm certain it's not of any surprise uh, to this group that diverse groups are positively correlated with decision-making outcomes. So diverse groups as opposed to homogenous groups um, focus more on facts. So they raise more facts, they are more likely to constantly re-examine facts uh, and remain objective in that process. They process those facts more carefully um, in part by considering the perspective of an outsider or someone different than themselves. Um, and diverse uh, perspectives or diverse groups are more innovative. So they will raise more radical ideas and alternatives, all of which have a positive impact to uh, the decision-making process and decision-making outcomes. So a question might be asked, well, who, who needs to be involved? How do I ensure I have diverse perspectives? And so when answering that question, we simply offer up a helpful framework that's based on Bain's rapid framework to, de uh, to uh, determine who to include in a decision. Um, I say it's, it's based on uh, Bain's framework because we've, we've added to both impact and proximity. So consider um, when determining your group of decision participants, who needs to recommend that decision, who needs to agree, input, who will life smartly be impacted by that decision? And I would highlight and acknowledge that that is often the group that is 
most left out, they're most forgotten in a decision-making process. The proximity, so uh, are those that are, are closest to the work, in fact, part of that decision-making process. And then finally, who performs ultimately once the decision is made and who decides? So who is the ultimate decision-maker in that process? The third step is designing your decision-making process for inclusion. So uh, let's acknowledge that including is not inclusion, meaning simply the act of um, inviting diverse perspectives to participate in your decision-making process is not necessarily inclusion. It's, it's not going far enough. Inclusion requires intentional design, intentional design of all of the things that make uh, your group different, be it work schedules, locations, abilities, device preferences, or, or so on. Um, I'll cite an example. Uh, in preparation for uh, this webinar, um, we decided to make the materials available in advance. And so um, some of you may have navigated to uh, the forum's website and pulled down that material in advance to give yourself time to perhaps prepare or consider the material so that you could arrive here in a good place to listen and participate. Okay. That's an example really of offering, um, let's say, options in terms of uh, how uh, to engage a group in a decision-making process and more broadly um, in, in collaboration. So please consider, right, are you in your process offering options for both asynchronous and real-time collaboration? Have you provided an agenda? Um, and perhaps most importantly, have you provided it in advance? Is there pre-work that you're asking this group to complete? So again, those that um, benefit from, let's say, time and reflection have the opportunity to do so and therefore can contribute more fully and completely to the discussion and to the decision that's to be made. Have you considered your technology solutions? Does everyone have access to these technology solutions? Does everyone know how to use it? And I'll highlight a, a perhaps a, a, an obvious point is, have you asked your stakeholders how they would like to collaborate or contribute to the decision-making process? And, you know, there's a, an excellent resource that we provide in the link there from a, a, a blog called Randscope. And in there, the author outlines this idea of user guides. In other words, every individual uh, involved in that collaboration or, in fact, in the decision-making process, highlighting to their co-participants um, how they prefer to work together, how they prefer to collaborate. Is that a, perhaps this is a good time to, to pause for questions. Is, is there any that have been surfaced that are relevant to um, the material I've shared so far? Yes, for sure. Uh, we have one uh, question asking you to comment on cultural differences and how these elements may vary across various groups with significant differences such as race, gender, wealth, age. And how can one possibly accommodate all participants' uniqueness and or differences? So um, on the, 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 the question of how does one possibly accommodate all uniqueness and differences of, of which one would include culture, in one word, it's options. So providing many options for participants to contribute to the decision-making process. Um, today, and I'm, I'm sure this is an experience um, common to many of the participants in um, the webinar today, uh, most decision-making process or collaboration are limited to real-time meetings. So in other words, meetings are the dominant form by which we engage in the decision-making process. And this, in fact, disadvantages those that have perhaps an analytical personality type, um, perhaps are more introverted or find meetings 
too stimulating or overwhelming. So offering that group options as to how that they contribute. And in particular, because I'm making the comparison to real time, asynchronous options. So can they submit questions um, or their contributions in advance, either via email or shared Google Doc or file repository? Options are the key to that. I'm going to continue to, to move along. Continuing on with the conversation about designing your decision-making process for inclusion. This also incorporates psychological safety. So you must design, you must create the conditions for psychological safety in your decision-making process um, so that participants can share their authentic perspectives. And the benefit, in particular to the decision-making process, is that that group or those individuals will in fact generate the broadest range of possibilities and ideas. They'll also be more likely to uncover hidden information. Hidden information is one of the, let's say, key enemies um, of uh, quality decision-making. But let's also acknowledge that doing so and doing so in creating the conditions for psychological safety that they will in fact feel heard and by feeling heard it will engender greater trust and buy-in of the process so there's some very simple let's say tactics or strategies one can use to create psychological safety in your decision making process and that may be to establish rules or guidelines like a no interruption rule or separating the stages of ideation and evaluation so people can offer up their ideas unencumbered or without the fear of, of being judged. Anonymizing contributions, in fact, is one of the simplest and yet most effective forms of creating psychological safety, knowing that this comment or this contribution cannot necessarily be associated to me and therefore um, I can say what I need to say without fear of judgment, reprisal, or the like. And then another common tool that we like to share is a team agreement to, again, set the appropriate expectations or boundaries of that decision-making process. And we highlight this here in the deck. It's a resource that's made available or can be available to you. Just simply go into on our website, powernoodle.com slash team agreement. That team agreement, again, focuses on setting expectations and boundaries and how you work with your team, um, communicating guidelines and ways of working, establishing principles to create psychological safety, and um, ultimately ensuring that no one is left out or, or left behind. A conversation regarding DE and I. Um, is incomplete, of course, without talking about without uh, without talking about <laughs> bias uh, and group dysfunction. And um, the same is true for decision making. Bias and group dysfunction, um, gone unchecked, can significantly uh, undermine an organization's efforts in making quality decision making. So behavioral scientists have documented more than 200 biases that cause well-intentioned people to trip in the decision-making process. So an effective event certainly begins with an awareness of these, I, uh, excuse me, an awareness of these biases and how to mitigate or interrupt them. So being able to recognize and, and resist. I'll just talk about a, a few here. Um, the first being the protection of mindset, which is, you know, whenever we encounter something that conflicts with our mindset, the first impulse is to reject or attack it. And some um, specific examples of that are the confirmation bias or overconfidence or status quo bias. We can mitigate that, resist it, right, by adopting a learning frame. So accepting that we don't know everything and that we uh, and what we currently believe in may be wrong. Um, mitigating uh, protection of mindsets can also be 
um, achieved by establishing a, a devil's advocate or someone appointed or given a specific role in your decision-making process to present a contrarian view. Personality habits, which are really just a collection of habits and personality characteristics that create them. So a simple example are, you know, extroverts are energized by real-time discussion with others, whereas introverts come away from such a discussion feeling drained. Um, and this is often referred to as a preference-based habit. Personally, I have a preference or a bias for action. So if gone unchecked, I may short circuit important aspects of the decision-making process in favor of progress. Um, personality and habit bias also um, uh, contains selectivity bias, which really encourages us to focus on the information that fits our customary way of, of viewing the work or, or the world as the case may be. Um, social influences, um, again, a very powerful bias in the decision-making process, really our beliefs and behaviors of a group. Um, some of the most common and probably well recognized are the conformity bias, which is really a tendency of people to behave like those around them rather than using their own personal judgment. Um, another bias, groupthink, is often used to describe the general tendency of the group to discourage diverse views. We can mitigate that by encouraging participants to voice dissenting views. And that goes hand in hand with some of the tactics to create psychological safety. We can anonymize contributions so that individuals do not feel, let's say, the pressure or the influence of that social group. And we can also construct teams to incorporate a diversity of skills, personality, and viewpoints. So again, I'll highlight that E&I is often um, a way to, in fact, mitigate some of the biases that often creep up in the decision-making process. And then the final step is creating information equity. And what we mean by that is that participants have access to the information required to effectively contribute to the decision-making process. Right? The, Antonym of information equity might be in information inequity or information privilege. So only certain people or certain groups have access to the needed information. And there's some very practical ways that that can be achieved. One is sharing relevant information by a common repository. One I'd like to highlight here is making space for perspective taking to create a shared understanding um, in um, many of our worlds or schedules were often booked Zoom meeting to Zoom meeting to Zoom meeting to Zoom meeting. And that leaves, let's say, little time or opportunity in those meetings to um, take perspective, right? To understand the way others think or view the world or a set of information. And then the final point I want to highlight on information equity is it not only applies to those participants of the decision-making process, but as well stakeholders of your decision-making process. So also consider those individuals that might be on the receiving end of what a decision is made. They too should have an understanding for how you and your team had arrived at a decision, who was involved, the alternatives or ideas generated, how those decisions were or alternatives were evaluated, the decisions made, and, and how it impacts them. Just to recap, right, the, uh, the path to quality decision making is in fact achieved by creating collaboration equity in your decision making process, which Starts with purpose, so declaring your decision, engaging diverse perspectives in your decision-making process, designing for inclusion. So remember, including is not inclusion. You must create or design the ideal conditions for participants to contribute to your decision-making process. Mitigating bias and group dysfunction, which can impact decision outcomes, and then creating information equity. So ensuring participants and stakeholders have the information they require to effectively contribute to the decision-making process. 
finally, how can we scale and sustain um, this um, uh, process, or rather, how can we institutionalize collaboration equity to make these practices sustainable, not only in your teams, but across the organization? And for that, I'd, I'd offer up a very common model of change management, people, process, and technology. People being you, the e and I professionals, as Dave has shared and established, you know, have a unique opportunity and a unique position to help organizations advance both the de and I goals, but as well decision quality, quite frankly, at the same time or within the same effort. So be the change. Demonstrate collaboration equity in the decisions you and your team make. Document and communicate how decisions are made in your team or organization. And um, I'd highlight GitLab's employee handbook as a, a great example. GitLab um, is a technology company um, and has taken the unique approach of open sourcing their employee handbook. So you type in, either follow that link or type into a search engine, GitLab decision-making process. They detail their decision-making process for their employees or quite frankly, for anyone who wishes to see it. And then finally, technology. Um, and I'll broaden this, technology and tools. So leveraging tools like Power Noodle to ensure that um, you have a scalable and consistent application of collaboration equity in your decision-making process. Leaving this up to individuals alone, even those well-trained and well-intentioned is incomplete. It needs to be baked into the DNA of the process, tools, and technology um, to, again, be institutionalized and made sustainable organization-wide. Susanna, we'd welcome questions. Perfect. We've uh, had quite a few questions. Thanks for everyone's uh, contribution here. Um, one of the questions is uh, if we have any materials uh, that will help DNI committee through uh, changes. Yes, um, we do make reference to a few materials at uh, the um, for those that downloaded the slide deck at the end of the mm -hmm. deck. I'll I'll surface a a few as I advance the slides here, but I'll call out um, a, a book that, quite frankly, has been very influential. Um, in helping we, being Power Noodle as an organization, make the tie between quality decision making and DEI efforts. So it's Indivisible by Allison Maitland and Rebecca Steele. Um, Indivisible was also um, the inspiration for the, the team agreement um, resource that I referenced earlier in the presentation. Um, the other is Bain's Rapid Framework, uh, which you can uh, follow the link through to. And then the decision quality book that uh, Dave referenced earlier in his presentation. So um, to be clear, we did not write that book. <laughs> so we're we're uh, um, uh, we're honest brokers here, but it it is um, it is well recognized as uh, the standard uh, in making quality decisions. Perfect. And we have one more question asking uh, you to speak on how to mitigate unconscious bias against race, ethnicity, culture, and disability. I know you touched on that, but if we can expand on that a little bit. Yes, I'm, I'm hopeful that some of the suggestions that we raised in the slide itself um, were, in fact, helpful in, in surfacing some of that. Um, uh, this, again, maybe my, my own personal preference, but um, I often find that, in fact, bias interrupters happen to be the most effective forms of mitigating um, the impact of bias and group dysfunction in the decision-making process. And so I'll, I'll give an example of that. Um, uh, uh, of course, we want to foster an environment where individuals have psychological safety in the decision-making process. If there is a, a discussion to be had that could, in fact, be influenced by social pressures, so let's say an employee and a boss, simple bias interrupter right, is to cohort those two groups. So in other words, do not have a direct report and you know, a superior or a boss 
participate in that discussion at the same time. Create a safe space for that employee to, in fact, um, uh, offer up their authentic perspectives without concern for, you know, do I need to support what my boss has advocated for in this decision? What will my boss think about my idea? Again, um, opportunities to, to interrupt that bias, so a, a process intervention. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just jump on that as well and add my two cents saying, you know, this goes to the point about creating what we call that psychologically safe environment. And the selective and intelligent use of anonymity can help, as is techniques like the nominal group technique. And, th and those things are deliberately created and should be part of a person's toolkit that want to actively, proactively manage those biases and mitigate them. Thank you, Dave. I think we've now reached time. Um, ben, any final thoughts as we wrap up? No, I just want to say that thank you both so much for the wonderful well, webinar. <clears throat> and um, I also read in, um, Indivisible by Allison and Rebecca, and we did a podcast about it. And that's all definitely a great book. Um, definitely um, highly recommend. And I highly recommend you check out the podcast as well. But yes, I just wanted to thank you both for the wonderful webinar. And I wanted to thank everyone um, who attended. And, um, and uh, thank you for this great information and for your great questions. Um, keep an eye out. We may be doing a follow-up podcast to get to some of the questions that we weren't able to answer in this webinar. So keep an eye out for that. Um, but uh, yeah, and um, as I prom as promised, the HRC activity ID is Five eight four four zero zero, and the SHRM activity is two two dash five F six N K. Then those we'll be sending those out in, um, in in an email after this with the with the survey link. Um, and I'm also going to go ahead and put it in the chat. Um, join us in February for advancing health equity for Black women through sponsorship with a, with Faith East. Eatman of University of Chicago Medicine on February 17th at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time. Um, and new episodes of the Forum podcast are available. Visit uh, forumworkplaceinclusion.org forward slash podcast to listen, or you, um, the podcasts are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Anchor, and Stitcher. Thank you again for joining everyone. Have a great day. I'm just going to put the code Thanks. in, the, in these codes in, or the activity IDs in there. That's for Sherm. And that is for HRC. And again, those will both be in the email, the survey email that'll be going out shortly after this. Um, thank you again and keep an eye out. Um, the recording of this um, this webinar will be available with, on our website within the next week and the slides are already available. So thank you again, everyone, for joining. Have a great day. And have a great year. Thank you. Thank you.